So here we have it, the man of the hour. Please welcome a New York City native, former New York City native. And he's on the show, a hit show called SEAL Team. Please welcome actor Justin Melnick in the house, baby. How are you? Wonderful. Thank you for having me today. Well, absolutely. Justin, I want to know, are you familiar with this building right here back in the days? Let me pull that screen closer up. Yeah, it's where I grew up. It was also in the opening credit of the Jeffersons. There you go. <laughs> so talk to me about the, did you, um, did you live like until you're like 23 years old in New York City? No, I lived there until I was 14. Mm -hmm. Moved up to New Hampshire, went to school up there, then went to University of Denver for a year. And then moved back to New York City to uh, drop out of college. I was going there for restaurant management and moved to New York City to go help my buddy open some restaurants. And I got into nightclubs from there. What nightclubs did you, were you involved in New York? Everything, dude. Uh, helped launch Bungalow 8, uh, launched this place called The Park uh, for Sean McPherson. It was a really awesome little private lounge on the top of his restaurant. I uh, started a place called Tonda back in the day for those guys. Worked at Lotus, at uh, Spa, at, uh, wow. I, I mean, any club that was kind of like A-list. That was, that was, you know, the celebrity-driven, kind of fashion-driven bars were the ones that I worked at. So you're probably familiar with my boy right here. Ah, Danny, yeah, I used to work for him, too, when I was a kid. Love that guy. Yeah, he said a lot of great things about you, actually, when he saw on the he's, Instagram story. He was like, what? No way. Get out of here. I love that guy. Danny's a legend. I love him. Biggest heart out of everybody. So did you, I mean, did you enjoy being a club promoter? I mean, did you have fun? I, I mean, I was 20. I did it till I was like 24 years old. You know, I was, I was in working in bars and nightclubs from from 19 to 24 25 you know and it was it was fun it was great i got paid to hang out with my friends and get drunk at night and hang out with celebrities and people's yachts in the south of france and be on private jets it was you know as a 24 year old it's awesome i'm glad i got to experience it you know i know it's not not what I'm interested in now at 41, but right. I'm glad that I got to live that life. Now, so when you were a club promoter, like, you know, what was the rule? Like, you got to turn people down and stuff like that. I mean, that's normal, right? Yeah, you know, it was, that was actually probably one of the things that sent me into public service just because I'll never forget one night I was running the door for one of my spots and I had, like some dude who was an ER doc you know, showed up with his girlfriend and obviously, you know, he, you know, didn't fit into what the club's criteria was, what they wanted on someone. But I mean, that dude spends day in, day out saving people's lives, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, like he's trying to get in and said, no, he pulled me aside. He like kind of told me what his situation was and like, listen, dude, I, you know, work at an ER. I don't make a million bucks a year like the rest of your clients, but like it's my girlfriend's or fiance's birthday. And like, I'm really trying to show her a good time. And obviously I let him in. And, and then, that, you know, that was one of the things that really started getting my mind, you know, cause we don't know, we don't know what we don't know. Right. Like, mm -hmm. you know, at 20, 24, 25 years old, you know, you don't know you don't always think about what people are going through in their day-to-day -day life. You don't take a pause from your own world and take a deep breath and think about, hey, I wonder what's going on in that guy's world. So that was actually probably one of my most eye-opening experiences, you know, uh, in that world. And then, you know, from there, I just, I, I kind of created an open-door policy for military and law enforcement uh, and firefighters and like anybody who, you know, if you worked in public service and you showed up in one of my spots, you were getting a bottle for free. If you were with a bunch of friends, you were, you know, fleet week, we'd have when fleet. week was in New York. I'd have like three dudes in uniform in Lotus, you know, the owners are like, what are you doing? I'm like, Hey man, they serve our country. We gotta, yeah. we gotta do. This. 
But you know what, Justin? Um, you always had a beautiful heart because, you know, during 9-11, you actually drove on your scooter down to, you know, the, uh, the financial center. And uh, you actually gave you know that? Because I do research, my man. What do you think? What do you think? I'm wow. just going to interview you without just knowing shit about you? Come on, man. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, you know, it's, I, I, I wish, I wish that I was 20 years older on 9-11. I think I could have done a lot more. I yeah, think you did, sorry. you did, you gave your, your whole heart and soul for that, you know, because, yeah. you know, you gave water to the NYPD, you know, you, you, you did what you can, you know. Yeah, well, I wish I was 20 years older than I think I could have done a lot more for those guys down there. There's a lot of dudes that spent many hours pulling body parts out and rubble and, you know, it, yeah. uh, the police commission did a really wonderful job organizing the response to that, Commissioner Carrick. And, uh, you know, I wish, I wish that I could have done more. It was, you know, I was there too, you know, so, and I lost six firemen that I knew, but yeah, it's, but the thing is what I'm trying to say is that you always had a beautiful heart, even back then, what you did, yeah. you know, how many 20 year olds could actually say, you know what, I'm going to give water to the NYPD or the fire department just to help out. Yeah. You know, but yeah. so after nine 11, you, you got into the nightclubs who introduced you into photography? Ah, so uh, I was living, I lived with this uh, really successful model at the time named Nicole Trinfio. And uh, I'd always been into photography in high school. Uh, my photography teacher, Rick, uh, was awesome and really pushed me and taught me how to shoot, develop, process film. And uh, I was always into shooting on 35 millimeter. So we were... We went out to the beach one weekend and we shot a couple rolls of film and I got them back and she loved them. So she's like, can, can I take these to my, to my agent to show her? So she, she took them to her agency, IMG, which was a huge agency at the time. And I mean, this, this girl had her book, her portfolio was filled with like Carl Lagerfeld pictures, Peter Lindbergh, you know, Dave LaChapelle, like every massive, I mean, this, she was an A-list, uh, a-list supermodel, you know, at, at that time. And so uh, her agent saw them, loved them, pulled apart her entire book from all of these awesome, awesome world-known photographers and, and basically used like eight of the images from, from just one day of us just hanging out, taking pictures. So uh, I was getting kind of fed up with the nightlife stuff. I just, I didn't, I didn't... It, it was cool for a second. Like I said, I'm glad I got to do it, but that's not who I wanted to be. That's not the life I wanted to live. I, I, I wanted to be healthy. I want to be productive. I want to be an asset. Um, you know, I, and I was trying to figure out what to do. And uh, so, you know, everyone, and my girlfriend at the time worked for uh, Chanel in Paris. Oh, sorry, she was an uh, Italian Vogue girl uh giovanna and she she was like you should just t start taking fashion pictures so started uh started shooting all the models that we knew from the nightclubs and putting together a portfolio and it just was the same thing as nightclubs it was, it was the same people the same energy the same lifestyle it was just a different time of day you know instead of being up till four in the morning i was you know hanging out with everyone during the daytime which it just, it's, again, it didn't, it didn't quench my thirst for what I wanted to be or who I wanted to be. Uh, and so I didn't know. And a nightclub buddy of mine at the time, it started up a charity and they put some wells in northern Uganda uh, during the first, like, time any of us were hearing about Joseph Kony. This was like 2005, 2006. So I bought a one-way ticket to Uganda and he gave me a GPS and I went up there to photograph the wells and made some friends and ended up staying for a month, just getting lost in that war zone and falling in love with conflict photography and, and, and thoroughly enjoying meeting these people, you know, people that wouldn't never see the inside of a nightclub people that you know their sole existence was surviving and being kind 
And, you know, no matter how little they had, they still found a way to be generous and kind. And, and that really kind of hit home with me. Yeah, because and, when you went uh, out there, it, it really like you really saw what how life is out there. And you're like, man, we're living in the United States. We're spoiled compared to what they're living out there, right? I mean, you take the worst case scenario here in the United States, and it's still better than living in northern Uganda and southern Sudan and Afghanistan and Yemen and in, in Palestine. You know, it's, we are so fortunate, fortunate to have access to something as simple as clean water. Yeah. You know, you can go to any tap in this country and turn it on and drink the water. It might not taste great. And it might not be the best quality in certain states, but it ain't going to kill you instantly if you drink it. Right, right, yeah. You know, that's, that's like huge. Like we forget about that every single day. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it's, it's something that I try and remind my children, uh, my friends. You know, it's like no matter how bad of a day we're having, it's still a million times better than 99.8% .8 of the world's population. Yeah. Now, you dropped out of... Uh, the college in Denver, why'd you drop out? Like, did you see like, nah, it's not for me. I was going to school for restaurant management. Mm -hmm. I had some dude who was a, I had some dude that was like a failed restaurateur trying to teach me how to open up restaurants. And like, mm -hmm. we were doing, we were doing like research and learning how to like work at a PF Chang's like, sorry, I'm, that's not me. I'm like, God bless you. If that's what you want to do. But like, I, I don't, want to do white glove service i don't want to have a michelin star restaurant i want to i want to open up a bar on the beach and literally grill steaks on it and play catch with my dog in between in between prepping steaks and serving them you know it's like i'm, I'm a simple dude i don't like fancy i eat steak every day or chicken salad vegetables you know just really primal i don't i don't need creme fresh on my mashed potatoes it's a little bit of salt and butter and we'll call it good maybe bacon if we <laughs> feel lucky is the meat at least grass-fed or no uh well all the cattle i raise are grass-fed and i i finish them with rolled oats and corn um and sugar lots of sugar mm. i like to keep them sweet uh but yeah i i don't like purely grass-fed beef doesn't taste great mm -hmm. it really doesn't you know, if you really want to get good marbling and good fat content, you got to grain them out on something. Right, some people right. use almonds, some people use dried olives and carrots. There's all these different ways to do it. But, um, you know, if, if I had access to a brewery, I'd love their spent grain because that would be mm. delicious. <laughs> yeah. Really? So it all comes down to, uh, you know, what your flavor profile preference is. But Justin, when you were a club promoter, I mean, there were a lot of hot girls in New York City. Were they hitting on you, too? I mean, you know, you're a good-looking bastard, too. You know what I'm saying? Like, shit. I did okay. did okay. Oh, okay. I mean, was it was it hard? No, it was fun. No, fun. Listen, you know, it's like... No, no, I'm asking you, it, was it hard to just settle with one that young? I mean, there's so many hot girls. You couldn't just have one girlfriend back then, did you? Never did. All right, good. <laughs> you know, it's listen... And it, it was fun. Everybody was traveling. It was it was a party. It's a different time than it was now. You know, now everybody's way more health conscious. Like, you know, during that time, you know, it was it was all about partying and traveling and fun. Now everyone's fitness and it's awesome. I, and I'm glad because I'm, you know, I don't I drink wine maybe once or twice a week. If that, I'll have a glass with dinner. But like, you know, I'm up every morning at the sunrise. I go to bed at 7.30 at night if I'm not working. You know, mm -hmm. sun goes down, I, I, I'm i asleep. Sun comes up, I'm awake. Between training and working my dogs and running my ranch and handling my other business and three kids, it's just, you know, doesn't stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When did you move to L.A., actually? So I moved to L.A. for after the pilot got picked up. I moved to L.A., season one for the second episode because we only thought i just got an airbnb i we only thought it was going to go 13 episodes you know yeah that's all we got for and uh i thought we were going to go shoot 12 more episodes and we'd be done and then it got up to 22 episodes and then we got picked up for season two season three so i kind of came and just never left 
But Justin, the story is amazing. I mean, what's the odds if you get a phone call? Like, yeah, you'll be our consultant and also you'll act. Like, what's the odds? No, it wasn't even that. It was, hey, can you bring your dog down for the pilot episode? Right, right. And I was like, and I was like yeah, sure. I mean, it'll be great training. They've got helicopters, CQB, pyrotechnics. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's a million dollar training day for my dog. Like, I'd be an idiot not to say yes to that. Um, you know, I showed up. I wasn't even supposed to be on the show. The like two days before Tyler called me, and he's like, "Oh my god, I just got here. The gear is absolutely horrible. Like, it looks like you know, it looks like we're playing playing an army unit out of like 2007. Help us out. So uh, I flew back to my office in New York where I kept all my gear, and um, I was in uh, Nevada at the time. And I flew back to New York, loaded up all my gear into, like, into tough boxes, shipped like 4,000 pounds worth of equipment overnight down to New Orleans. So we used all the gear and then, uh, and then during all the, uh, the prep stuff, the showrunner, the showrunner was like, well, you should just be one of the seals on the team because you, you know, originally Sonny Quinn was supposed to be the dog handler. Mm, AJ that's that that's why you saw you know him with her in that pilot episode trying mm -hmm. to pick up the girls um and then uh then Ed Redlich our showrunner at the time said you should just be you should just be the dog handler on the show I was like don't I need to know how to ax her and he was like nah you'll figure it out so uh so did that and then uh, as the final script revision came out, the creator of the show, who's also like the, the guy who wrote the, the pilot, Ben Caval, came up to me. He's like, hey, I got a present for you. And I, and I was like, what's up? And he gives me a script. He goes, check out the last pages. And, you know, it says Brock and Cerberus exit. So he named my character at the end of the pilot. So that was wow. pretty cool. Now, before before you got into this, right, um, you were actually a cop in Indiana? Yeah, so I, I worked part time as a police officer in Indiana, and then I kind of had a consulting company which helped law enforcement and military with other stuff. So um, I was running around, running around the country, meeting with different units and learning how they do stuff and bringing it back home to our small department. So now a New Yorker moving to indiana i mean was that tough was that a tough adjustment because I, I can't imagine absolutely i don't know man i i'm i there are people that grow up in new york and have to get out immediately and then there are people that grow up in the midwest and ha their dream is to get to new york and live in new york and there's nothing they could see or smell or have happened that will ever get them to leave can't explain it i don't understand it at all but it's, cities aren't in my dna like I'll go to New York for 9-11 to go pay my respects every year. Mm -hmm. But other than that, n not a chance. I won't go there to see family. I won't, I won't go. I'll go out to Long Island. But to go into the city and walk around, it, it's, a, it's a feeling that crushes my soul. Yeah. There's, it's a, I feel like I'm in a prison cell in New York City. It feels so confined. You can't breathe. I like air. I like nature. I want to be outside. I don't want to be going from restaurant to coffee shop to restaurant to bar. I want to be in the hills, in the mountains, seeing beautiful sights, smelling beautiful flowers, and uh, breathing fresh, clean air. All right. Well, listen, I, I hear you, man. I kind of like that, but not every day you know what i mean i need the city and i need some of that like when i went to the south to watch college football i was like man you could breeze down here man <laughs> look at this you know so well, south air is heavy and it's a lot of humidity down there yeah but it was in november so it was perfect weather you know yeah so now here's the thing how did you get involved with dogs like i know i love dogs too man but how did it happen tell us that story uh, so uh, I was out, roommate had bought Dita, uh, he was a city police canine handler, and he needed to get rid of her uh, for some personal circumstance stuff going on at the house. And uh, he, he was trying to sell her to 
another mutual buddy down in Texas. And I was like, a couple drinks in me. I was like, no, 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 no. It's too good of a dog. So, so I, I took her and uh, had to sort out vehicles and all that stuff. But then I, I pitched my town board and my police department on, on taking her on as a, as a, uh, as a search and rescue dog. We, uh, Joplin, Joplin, uh, it wasn't Joplin. It was the big set of tornadoes that happened right before Joplin, mm-hmm. um, went down and, and I, and I kind of was like, Hey, let's get money from our emergency management and let's get her trained up on, on cadaver and, you know, dead people odors. And let's go out and do some search and rescue stuff. Cause being in the Midwest and at that time I was so mobile and flexible because I didn't have a wife. I didn't have kids. You know, I could jump in a car and disappear for two weeks and it wouldn't affect anybody. So I was like, we could really do some good with this. Let, let's go down. So uh, a buddy of mine who is a former uh, dog handler attached to SEAL Team 6 took Dita and got her all imprinted on the odor and the scent and gave me a little toe to take home so that I could keep working her. Um and, uh, I mean, she was great. Then, you know, the show kind of ended up happening, uh, about a year and a half later, uh, that program, we weren't able to get the funding. So, so just stopped her training on that and started imprinting her on narcotics so that we could mm-hmm. use her for road interdiction and all that kind of stuff. And you, you, you grabbed her when she was a puppy. Uh, I got her when she was about eight months old. Oh my God, so cute! <laughs> you guys have a special bond, right? I mean, yeah. you guys are like, how old is she now? So, uh, seven. Nice. She'll be eight in July. And you take her? Yeah, everywhere, she's a great. Right? She goes everywhere with me. I mean, now now she stays with the wife and the kids when mm-hmm. I go places because L.A. is, you know, when we're when we're back in L.A., I just don't feel safe. You know, they've decriminalized everything in that city and when the general population is is sadly paying the price for it with the amount of home invasions and mm-hmm. attacks on the street and violent crime and it's really wait really, so justin really, you live where right now i live up in santa barbara up in the mountains oh okay so you're, still, have, you're still in california then yeah, yeah yeah we have a house okay. also in los angeles for during the week well well, I'm working or if the kids have stuff that they have to do there. Right, right. Well, Santa Barbara's nice. I've been there before. I lived in L.A. for 10 years, so I know what it's like. Yeah, it's beautiful up here in the mountains. You don't feel like you could be anywhere in the world right now up here. Yeah. So now with this dog, I mean, people are falling in love with Dita, right? I mean, she's, she's like a celebrity, right? <laughs> I think uh, I think she's she earned it, man. She She's worked hard. She's done all. A lot of good to help people, and uh, and she she goes out and gives it a hundred percent with whatever she's doing, wherever she is. So, Justin, how do how do you train a dog like that? Like, how many hours does it take to really, really understand what she has to go to accomplish? She's really intuitive. You know, she can she can learn. It usually takes three three times for her so for example to teach her how to jump over a six foot wall you know i'll i'll do hold it on with a hold on a minute i think you're delayed hold on okay speak right now hello yeah hold on yeah i think you delayed a little bit on what's going on okay so speak right now hello yeah there you are all right you're back so say that again um uh, to teach her how to do something is usually takes about three times. So if, you know, to jump over a six foot wall, I'll usually keep her on leash and run her up to the wall and jump her up it. And then I'll do it a second time. And then on the third time, she'll know what I want her to do and she'll go get it done. And she's not camera shy. She loves the cameras. She's indifferent. <laughs> I mean, I look at her on the red carpet. I'm like, yeah, she's just chilling. Like, yeah, you know, I'm part of the crew. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's, it, you know, what it comes down to with dogs is just exposure to stuff. Right. You take it with you to go do stuff and they learn that it's okay. You know, it's like there's some things like thunder, lightning that are hard to train out. Mm-hmm. But 
um, the like camera flashes and stuff like that. You just associate it with treats and food, and it becomes fun. You know what I love about your show? Pretty much the whole crew knows about the SEAL, uh, a Navy SEAL's life, right? Like, they know everything, right? Like, a, a consultant's on set. These guys are real SEALs. If you make one little mistake, like how to hold a gun or anything, they'll correct you, right? Yeah, so the show's done a wonderful job. Our leadership has really put veterans in a position to help. Um, I mean, they've hired over 350 veterans for this show, everywhere from executive producers to directors to producers to writers to actors to sound guys to hair and makeup to electric to set decoration to transportation. You know, you, you, you always know SEAL Team is shooting somewhere because there's a lot of American flags flying high, mm. you know. There, there, there's a huge amount of respect given to these men and women that, that have served our country, and they make our show great. You know, the writers are fantastic, and they know what questions to ask, and, and, and they really care about telling the story. When you carry that bag, do you really have, like, weapons that weigh to, like, 60 to 80 pounds? Or what Which you, bag? The, the bag that you carry in the back, the backpack. Like, if we're carrying a backpack? Yeah, yeah. You know, when you go on a mission, you guys have a bag? Yeah, it, it depends. Generally, we'll stuff it, you know, with a couple bottles of water. Because you want to have some weight in it. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it looks weird. Right. You know, if there's things strapped onto it, those are always real. Everything we use on the show is real. So our radios are real. Our night vision is real. Our helmets, our body armor. We don't have plates in the body armor. Obviously, we're not using real bullets. Well, of course. We use right. blanks. But, um, you know, there's, yeah, you know, you, your, your daily loadout is 20, 25 to 40 pounds worth of stuff on you during the day. Versus, you know, in real life, it'd be 60 to 100 pounds. But, you know, you still run around 12 hours in full kit with all that stuff. It, it takes it out of you. I really take my hat off to, to, to all the boys out there that are, that are doing this. You know, there's a lot of respect for these Navy SEALs because I, I look at the numbers. Like, let's say 160 enter the training and only six to eight graduate. I, I don't know exactly what the what the attrition rate is for bugs, but but you know it's it's the same thing. You know when when you ask me, it's the same thing. If I respect guys from SEAL Team Six at the same level that I respect guys in the National Guard that are Intel guys or Commo guys or non deployable. Listen, if you're willing to take a job where you know that you're going to miss birthdays, anniversaries, you know your friends' weddings possibly funerals mm -hmm. to go serve our country and make sure that that we can have the freedom to live and the safety under that umbrella of what our armed forces does for us whether you're coast guard marine corps army navy air force like space force like these men and women day in day out are serving our country the, there's a chance that they might get killed. Yeah, there's a chance you might get killed today driving in a taxi in New York City. But you have the control, your job, you have the control of your life to decide if you want to go to your friend's wedding, to be there for your kid's birthday. These people are all signing up for a job where they can't control their life, but they're doing something for the greater good. And, and that's that's where the respect comes. I don't, you can do 600 pull-ups, run 20 miles, and then swim for 10 miles and shoot 20 dudes in the face. Yeah, that's pretty cool. But, but like, the reason you have my respect and I'll do anything I can to help you and your cause is because you're sacrificing all of, all of what we take for granted yeah. in order to serve our country. So that's kind of my... No, no, no I, I totally agree with you with that. Every time I see a veteran and let's say he's homeless and I come out, I come out of a 7-Eleven... He's like, hey, it's on me. Come inside. I got you. You know, what's two slices of pizza and coffee? As every American should. Yeah, I do, that all, the, I do that all the time to veterans. We failed our troops and where our government has failed our troops and our veterans. Mm -hmm. It's every person's duty here to do something like that. Yeah. And, um, you know, 
I had AJ Buckley, your guy. Uh, who's that? Uh, you know, have you ever heard of him? I, I you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out who, who's this guy, AJ Buckley, right here. You know, this guy, this this stud. Never right heard here. of her. <laughs> Never but, heard. Of her. Oh, know, that guy. That that's guy. The dude yes. From Yellowstone, right? That's the <laughs> that's the dude from Yellowstone that takes everybody to the train station. I yeah, know him. I, I think that's him. Yes, yes. <laughs> But, AJ's the best. I believe he has a Twinkie strapped onto his back in that photograph. Oh, does he? <laughs> I, I Velcroed on a Twinkie one day. You know, AJ, like, he um, he DM'd me this morning. He goes, look, let me tell you something about this guy, all right? So I'm, I'm going to share it with you. He says, um, hold on a minute. Let me get to it because we had a conversation. And... He says, I will tell you this. Justin is one of the most genuine people I have met. He does more for charity and helping vets than any other cast member. We break his balls because this is his first job as an actor. There are not many people in this business that I know would show up at 3 a.m. when I needed help. Justin is the guy that will always be there. That's what he said about you. That's super sweet. Yeah, I, lo I love AJ. AJ, AJ, AJ is the reason that people are able to smile on. I mean, just the funniest, the funniest character, written and per like his delivery of it, and it's who he is. Like yeah. AJ might have been born in Ireland, but that dude's a fucking Texan. Like he is, his heart is so Texas. He's more American than a lot of Americans I know. It's incredible. And he's Canadian. Well, he's Irish. Moved Irish, to Canada. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, you know, it's like, yeah, but, I know a lot of dudes in the teams. I know a lot of guys from the unit that we portray on SEAL Team. And uh, AJ, AJ would have done fine there. If he, if he had woken up at, at, at 18 years old and said, I want to go to Bud's, been great there yeah he's special because my friends are like yo man is he really from texas i'm like i'm not gonna say <laughs> it's called acting and he happens to be very good at it very good you know i met him at a crossfit crossfit hollywood and he took me in the first 10 seconds he's like yo man you cool as well, hell. that came out really wrong you met him at a crossfit hollywood and he took you and well, he took me in like a good friend. I, I, I know what you're talking about. He took me in like, yo, you're my boy now, all right? I'm like, all right, all right. I'm like, who are you? I'm like, my name is AJ. I was like, Did that right. conversation start out with like, hey, dude? And he was like, hey. Yeah, what just kind like of that. Using? Oh, cool. Yeah, I use, I use Redcon. Yeah, what, what kind of protein supplement are you on? <laughs> Is that how the whole conversation started or like? No, hey, he was like, yo, you're from New York? I'm like, yeah. But he's like, man, I love you New Yorkers, man. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> you know, New so. Yorkers are great people. They, 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 New Yorkers generally lack that gene called giving a shit. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're, they're great. New, New York, if 9-11 had happened in any other city, it would have been even more catastrophic. New York, New Yorkers have soul. Yeah. New Yorkers can 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 pull it together through the toughest times. That that city, that city, that city is. I give it that for sure. Yeah. So, you know, that's what that's why EJ talks highly of you. And you know, I'm so happy that I have you on my show because you know, I just randomly I get all these people on my own. You know, I'm a nobody. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like I have a scripted show yeah, now. Everybody, brother. Huh. Everybody's somebody and everybody's nobody. That's true because, look, even you, when you moved to L.A., you just you never knew who you're going to be talking to. And all of a sudden, these guys become big. And I, like, hey. I will die one day and no one will remember who I am in 500 years. Nah, you know, man. <laughs> no one will remember who I am in 200 years. All we can do is control what we have right now and right, do as yeah. good and right now. Help as many people as we can right now because in the end of the day, None of it does. None of it matters. We're all just dust. Right. Exactly. So now, tell me about um the Price is Right. Did you actually like? 
Did you do some research like two weeks before and go to like, let's say, uh, Home Depot and say, all right, let me check on some, you know, if this, let me check on this price. Let me check on the no, I did, price. I just bought my, my ranch and I had spent days in Home Depot buying washing machines, dryers, home bed, bath and beyond everywhere. I, I, I was furnishing my ranch. So I, I knew the pricing on absolutely everything. Oh, so you see, you got Dita and you right there trying to spin the wheel. Yeah. I mean, I knew the price because I literally just bought that dryer two weeks before. And you won like $100,000, right? We raised a lot of money yeah, for charity. But you raised yeah. money and you were part of like 100000 You were clutch, man. That, you know, it's the, the one memorable moment of that of that was it was a veteran uh a veteran game so everybody had served and one of the veterans came up pulled me aside and we just done the the advertisement for the crisis center hotline mm -hmm. and uh one of the veterans pulled me aside and they said to me that they saw the commercial and it saved their life they were in a dark place and they called the number and that commercial that seal team and and cbs put together kept her on the, kept them on this earth wow. um so uh that right there was the greatest takeaway out of that day it's it's the amount of good that this show has done and the amount of people that this show has helped i mean it, it is that's the greatest part about being on it Oh, that's a great picture of Deet spinning the wheel. See, I just, yeah, I just told you. I'm like, oh, look at the pictures. You see, I have this program that I can put pictures of while I'm talking to you live. Awesome. Yeah. A lot of fun stuff, you know? Yeah, it's cool being on TV, but, like, honestly, the, the stuff that we're able to pull off, the initiatives we're able to do through that network and through that, through that avenue is just... It, it's given me purpose in my life. It's, it's helped fulfill a massive void in something... You know, that was there. Justin, when you uh, uh, got on season one and season two and all these seasons, were you single at the time? Yeah. So, like, when a girl sees you, right, and, and like, let's say she approaches you and says, what do you do for a living? What do you tell her? I'm a SEAL team guy? <laughs> no, no, no. You know, it's weird because for the first year and a half, two years, I was a cop, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I, you know, I, I still technically am, but... You know, I don't do any police work, so it, it's hard, you know, like, if you ask me what I do today, I'd tell you I work in law enforcement, though, like, that's, that's where my heart is, that's what I, that's, that's what I want to die as, like, it's cool to be an actor, and I'll continue mm -hmm. doing this, because it's the best job I've ever had, and it's fun, and you get to interact with great people, you get to go to cool places, and you get to use this platform to help people, but, you know, if, it's, uh, you know, if you ask me what I do, I'd say I work in television, you know, right, and, right. No, you because, know, you know, you know, back then, you know, five, six years ago, it's like, you know how women are in Hollywood. You know how that, you know, what do you do for a living? Oh, I do this. See ya. What do you do for a living? Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, uh, yeah. You know, I'm a producer. Oh, really? Oh, well. You the know. good news is, you know, in Hollywood, you know, SEAL team is pretty big throughout the Midwest and other places. In New York mm -hmm. and L.A., there are definitely pockets of people that watch it. But like, you could go anywhere and tell a chick that you work on a TV show called SEAL Team and they'd be like, oh, I don't know what that is. Right, right. <laughs> but they, you know, but they know a reality <laughs> show really well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was Snooky shoe designer. Right, best right. Brand and all. <laughs> no, it's, it's, uh, I got to put you on pause for one second. I'm sorry. You're back. Look at that. You know, I just made it like, he'll be back. He real quick. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, so no, nah, don't worry you know, about it. Listen, going out in LA and trying to meet girls isn't, you know, not. No, no, no. I'm just in my car. when they approach you. That's what I'm trying to say. You know what I mean? It's like when they start talking to you. Yeah. Usually, usually just say work in television right, or right, right. something on the fly. Now, have you ever had it after like two, three seasons? Of like, oh my god, aren't you the guy in SEAL Team? Not that much in yeah. LA. Yeah, sometimes in LA, mostly in the Midwest or Texas, mm -hmm. or you know, when I go places, uh, it's always fun. Sometimes, like just because normally on the show I have a beard, 
Mm -hmm. And real life, I'm usually clean shaven. Mm -hmm. You know, so people, it looks like the dog from SEAL Team. It's, I like that. And guess what? It is the dog from SEAL Team. You want a picture with her? And people get really excited and you get to make people smile. So it's nice. You know, Justin, I have to say, your lovely wife, the story in the van, the first time you went on a date, if a woman could sacrifice that, holy shit, she's definitely a keeper, as you can oh, see. You listen to the Drinking Brothers podcast? I listened to I caught it a little bit. I was like, huh? That's yeah. what happened to him in the van? <laughs> what? Day in life, it happens. Some people get embarrassed by it. Other people embrace it, and other people laugh at it. It is what it is. That that was great. I mean, that was a great story. <laughs> that was the first date. No. And it was, the, it was the first date. It was the first real date. We'd met and okay. we'd hung out for about three months and everything, you know, we were just hanging out as friends, like super casual, mm -hmm. nothing, nothing aggressive, just, just like getting to each other and, you know, spending you time meet? as friends. We met through mutual friends. Oh, okay. But was there any attraction going on? Anything even in the beginning as friends? Of, of course. Of course there was. But, you know, when someone has two children, like, you, you got to be respectful and you, you can't just jump into that, you know? Right, right, right. Every interaction. You know, it's not just her feelings. It's kids' feelings and, yeah, yeah. you know got to be really careful dating when someone has children is is a whole different kettle of fish so previously she had two kids right with another guy yeah and when you came in the picture and then when you started dating you know after three months when you guys got serious um did the kids feel comfortable around you i mean you know it's hard because you know you're not their real father that's the thing you know i get it no, I'm not there, and I'm not trying, you know, it's, it's, uh, you just be kind and take it low and be aware of people's feelings, and, right. you know, it's, it's not, it just has to happen organically, right, like, it right. can't, not something you can force, children are like sand, the, the harder you squeeze, the more slips through your finger. You just got to sit there with an open palm and be there to support them emotionally and right. teach them things and have a good time with them and, and also enforce, you know, the rules. But, you know, there's a way to do it and there's a way not to do it. Right, exactly. Yeah. I mean, look, I grew up without a father. He left me when I was four. What do I know? You know what I mean? Like, I don't know anything, you know, as far as, you know, having... No. Do. Only a true wise man will tell you that they know not. Say that again. Only a true wise man will tell you that he knows nothing. Yeah, I mean, I didn't know anything. and um, But, you know, I had, you know, I was a baseball guy. I had a full ride scholarship down in Florida. And, um, you know, but during my times in Little League and in middle school and high school, I had a lot of parents that, you know, my teammates' fathers would take care of me and take me in like, hey, Eddie, man, we got you. Don't worry about it. We know your mom's working. They'll call my mom. You're, you're going to hang out with us, you know, so everything will be okay. So, you know, it's a great feeling like that, you know? It's it's great that you, you had that, you yeah. know. Father or 20 fathers. It's great to have 20 fathers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it was great. You know, they took me in. It was so much fun, man. It was so much fun just... He's saying, hey, Eddie, you're doing good, you know, and I was a good kid. I never got into trouble. The only time I got into trouble when I played wiffle ball and I'll break windows accidentally. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> you know, um, so now as far as um, I love this picture. So you got a, a baby boy with her, right? Is his name mm -hmm. Bronson? Yep. Yeah. And this picture right here with Dita is so cute. I mean, is it right here? Let me get to it. This picture right here. I mean, it yeah. was like, yeah. I got she another brother. Lo she loves him. It is so precious watching them together. Mm -hmm. Just Dita the nanny dog. They are so cute together. He'll just sit there and tug on her ears, and she'll clean all the food off of his face. <laughs> <laughs> they 
really she gets so excited i mean she loves the other kids as well like when the other mm-hmm. kids wake up start singing in the morning and and trying to get out the door to go to their rooms and say say good morning to them she's dita's just a one in a million most you know, precious world i had a black lab for 13 years you know lived a great life but the bond like these dogs i feel like they're 90 percent human Right? Do yeah. you get that feeling too? These dogs. I give her ninety-eight percent human. 98%. She. Oh. Yeah. You take her everywhere. Not anymore, but you know, before, before the wife and kids, yeah, she'd come with me. Now I like her. I like her with my wife just because I think it's a nice level of of security. Right, uh, right. So let me ask you this: You also have a. a you invested in a company too, right? When you were younger a little bit. I think it was Coconut Water. Yeah, yeah. How's that going right now? Great. I sold out of it. Uh, oh, okay. it IPO'd for like $4.7 billion or something crazy like that. I don't know. But yeah, it was a great a great investment. Did well by me. Great product. Great people. I hope it continues to grow. Has it ever happened to Navy SEALs or anybody, in, you know, in the Army or Marines ever come up to you and say, man, your show, uh, I'm, it's so real. It's so organic. I love it so much, man. That ever happened? Thousands of times. Wow. Every day, you know, listen, I love when people, anyone who says, hey, love the show, it means a lot, you know, to see it and it's entertaining and like, thank you so much. You know, I don't, I'm glad because... Every single person on that set gives 100% for 12 hours a day, 14 hours a day. Like people are there working and giving it 100% right. of their life, of their energy, of their input, of their, of their trade craft, 100%. People do not slack on that set. It is not an easy job. And Max, AJ, Neil, David, you know. These guys come on, and these dudes give it their full, 100% of the time for the entire season. So there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that go into that show. Now, what really gets it for me is like when you get a guy from the military that's like, hey, I love that show. It allows me to sit down with my 14-year-old son and show him why I haven't been home for the last 14 years. And opens up an avenue for them to ask questions. You know, when the, when you get those kind of things, like wow, thank you, like that 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 feels good. You know, because it's a it's a TV show, man. It's not the most important thing in the world. There are a million jobs way more important than making a TV show. But but if you can impact one person's life and create an opportunity for them to bond with their child, game on. That's like the greatest thing you can ever say. See this picture right here? That makeup is so authentic. I'm trying to figure makeup. out that. Who wears makeup, dude? I took myself and slammed my face into a concrete wall four times for that. Oh, come on now. Seriously, no. Really? Great. No, oh, I was about to say. I'm like, nah, you can't ruin your face like that, man. <laughs> I'm not Daniel Day-Lewis. Come yeah. on. Well, you kind of look like him with that hat on right now. <laughs> repping, repping the Bravo. Yeah. So this picture right here, wow, that looks so good. I was like, wow, look at that. The lips is like hanging and all that. Oh, I have a better one. I have a better one I should post, which is like, I actually like, because I was blown up, so I was laying down and you don't want to swallow that stuff. So it's all just like dripping out of your mouth. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I was the fourth person that, that David rescued right, and pulled out of the rubble. So like, I just had a big pile of bleh. Oh, it was, yeah. It was great. It was a, that was an awesome episode. Yeah. Tell me the story about accidentally you out of a helicopter or something. What happened with you in the helicopter? Mm-hmm. I mean, this has nothing to do with the TV show. You didn't no, no. I, I don't generally talk about it just because people don't care. But, uh, well, I yeah, care. The news Shit. Completely, <laughs> the news completely reported wrong. I didn't really care. The only thing I cared about is that they mentioned that it had nothing to do with the team. Um, I was out, uh, getting some content and stuff like, uh, and I was doing a hoist up to a, uh, up to a Blackhawk 
and the line snapped. So I had a catastrophic equipment failure on a hoist. I was basically hanging, you know, 26 to 30 feet off the ground and the line snapped on us. Oh my God. And how did you yeah. land? Like, did you land on your back? I did. Luckily, it was just a perfect, you know, the number one thing I teach to military and law enforcement is when you're doing hoist, fast roping, repelling with your dog is to always keep your dog above you. Um, and normally that because most of the time people fall from like three or four feet off of the ground. Uh, and a three foot fall onto your dog in full kit will definitely put something on your dog. So I always keep them above me. And so luckily, you know, I play the way I preach. So, um, Dino no. was above me uh -huh. and no. I fell and I kind of, a, a PLS, the parachute uh, landing fall, where my feet hit, and then my butt, and then my back and my head. So, mm. I mean, I landed as perfect as you possibly could in that situation. In all honesty, I probably should have been dead because I should have been at 280 feet. Oh it was just, uh, I yeah, long story, but uh, so, I'm lucky. I'm fine, so I walked out. The ER on a backboard and walked out four hours later on my two feet. So pretty much, if you were a gymnast in the Olympics, you would get a perfect 10 the way you landed. 100%. Wow. Or if I was in second grade, I'd get a gold star from my teacher. <laughs> That's awesome. That day, sadly, I only walked away with a participation award. <laughs> right. <laughs> so now, do you have something prepared just in case, you know how TV shows go after six, seven, eight years, you know, which is a hit after five years. You got anything prepared going on? You have anything that you have a plan to do something after this? Life without a plan is dangerous, my friend. Yeah, yeah, I know. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, listen, Justin, you, uh, you talked everything. Okay, now look, here's another thing. Here's the question I want to say, I want to ask. If there was a movie about you, a biography about Justin Melnick. Who would you hire to play you? You said you, you know, let's just say you're excluded. You, you're not, you, you can't do it. Well, well, who would play me? Yeah. And you don't have to be a SEAL team guy. You could pick anybody. No, I would probably have. I don't know. There's so many different stages in my life. You'd need three or four different people for the whole thing. Mm, okay. Well, look, like we can't look at the younger days, but okay, as of, let's say from 30 and up, the last 10 years. 30 and up to play me. Uh, Mark Wahlberg. Ah, he's the man. I love Mark Wahlberg. Uh, I don't know. That's a really good question. Luckily, I'm not a casting agent, so. Right. Uh, I have no idea, man. <laughs> I, hey, there'd never be a movie about me. Nobody cares. And, uh, and, and B, I'm sure there's, there's, there's a thousand people out there walking the streets of LA right now that would do a wonderful job of it. Absolutely. But Mark Wahlberg is also a big fan of the military. And yeah, Mark Wahlberg seems like a great dude. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. guys for the community. Yeah, exactly. Well, listen. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity because, you know, I just Thanks caught you on instant. Huh? Thanks for having me on. It was a pleasure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, keep in touch. Um, you know, I got you on Instagram. So, <laughs> and as AJ said, he's so authentic and he's right. Thank you so Thank much. You. Take care. Have a All great right. day. Guys. Enjoy it. Okay, so finish.